It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Leo's off today, but Andy Anatko, Serenity Caldwell, and Allison Sheridan are all here. We're going to talk about Apple lawsuits, Apple patents, and Apple's problems in the education market. It's all coming up right now on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 431 for December 2nd, 2014. iPhone lands on its feet. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace recently launched the latest version of their platform, Squarespace 7, which has a completely redesigned interface, integrations with Getty Images and Google Apps, new templates, and an incredible feature called Cover Pages. Try the new Squarespace at squarespace.com and enter the offer code MACBREAK at checkout to get 10% off. And by NatureBox. NatureBox ships great tasting snacks right to your door. Start snacking smarter with wholesome, delicious treats like lemon tea biscuits. To get your complimentary NatureBox sampler, visit naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. And by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you'll finally have all your financial life in one place and get a clear view of everything you own. Best of all, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash macbreak. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show where we cover Apple in all its glory. Leo is out today. My name is Mike Elgin. I'm the news director here at Twit. And with us is the incomparable Andy Enotko, Chicago Sun-Times technology columns. How are you doing, Andy? I'm doing pretty good. People do compare me to other things, usually not in a positive way. So thank you for brushing that over. Uh, if I'm incomparable, <laughs> that's nothing. that can be nothing but an upgrade. I don't like being compared to things because... Well, I will try to not do that. And uh, in fact, I would have never done it. I would never do that. I uh, really enjoy your work. I really enjoy all your appearances on this show. And also, um, I'm going to make a pitch right now. I'd love to get you on Tech News Today much more often. I think this year you've only been on the show once, twice, three times. Uh, but I, I'd really love to get you on that show more. I'd like, I've loved it every time I've done it. I'm just here darning socks by the fire waiting for that phone to call, Mike. All right, we're going to send you a special and, uh, red phone that lights up when I call. So uh, that, that'll be a lot of fun. And with that, us that, also, because I, I usually am dressed as Batman. So oh, that, really? That That's perfect. Now, now I'll have a reason to do that. Absolutely perfect. Uh, goes with the cave. And with us today is Serenity Caldwell, panelist on the Incomparable podcast, and also iMore managing editor. Right? Yes, that is correct. Um, I'm I'm happy to be here filling in for Renee and and other erstwhile podcasters. That's fun. Please don't mind the uh, slightly strange appearance behind me. I am podcasting from a basement, but it does have extraordinarily good Wi-Fi. So it doesn't it look like a basement. Right. It looks like an attic. <laughs> what are you going to do? But it's so. Cor <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. The 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 job title of managing editor <laughs> is the best job in all of editorial. Dumb. Am I right or am I wrong? Um, Oh, great. We're having Skype issues. I'm pretty sure just mentioning anything about Wi-Fi is enough to set it off. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Serenity. We didn't hear that. Uh, <laughs> Skype uh, sort of uh, collapsed on us a little bit. Yeah, no, it's lagged. Here, let me do a, let me do a quick reconnect. Okay. Pretty All much. Right. I, I quite like my new title. Um <laughs> Okay, yeah, we're getting we're getting <laughs> that serious. That was a great line. like freeze frame. <laughs> Yay! All right, let me let me like let me work on like this. Agatha, okay. It's like an Agatha Christie Christie story where <laughs> first there were four panelists, and now Renee's gone, and now Alex is gone, and Leo's gone, down to just you know, I, oh, I'm, I must be the murderer then because I've I've lured people to like this this Swiss chalet. Say yes, we need some substitutes for the podcast. <laughs> Don't question yourself about whatever happened to Leo and to Renee. It was perfectly normal things that happened. <laughs> oh, listen to you with your fanciful things about how nobody just simply gets impaled upon a brass candlestick when they're skiing outside. <laughs> that's that's a Imagine. painful image. Thank you so much for that, Andy. So, do we have? Do we yeah, have I believe so. Hi, uh, yeah. Let's, let's is this, check. Is this working here. again? Oh, fantastic! Oh, there Look we go. That. Wow, it's a Skype miracle. I was asking you if managing editor, which I found to be one of the great greatest jobs ever in editorial work, uh, and I was asking you how you like being a managing editor. 
I quite like being a managing editor. You know, when uh, when Renee first hired me on at iMore, he's like, well, you know, titles, they're just kind of, eh, you know, you're welcome to choose what you want. But we were thinking like managing editor iOS. I'm like, no, 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 I don't need to. I don't need to choose. That sounds great. Yeah. That sounds <laughs> fantastic. So I, I'm I'm quite enjoying it. Um, and it does it does have a kind of all encompassing feel to it, which I think aptly describes some of the stuff that I've I've done so far in the first couple of months that I was just, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, editorial or uh, proofing, editorializing, taking some video, yep. all over the board. Managing editors are the only people in an editorial operation that know everything and have all the power. So uh, that's why it's such a fantastic job. Well, let's jump into the Apple news. We've got uh, some Apple news, not a whole lot. This is one of the weird things about covering Apple uh, is that uh, they're not like Google, which is always constantly leaking out bits of news and information. Apple releases official news two, three times a year, something like that. And then the rest of the year, we're all on our own to scramble and figure things out. And we rely on the good goodness of people to file lawsuits against Apple so that we have something to talk about. So Apple's in court today, uh, and they are faced with a $1 billion lawsuit, class action suit over iPods and music uh, stuff. And it's actually a $350 million lawsuit, but it gets tripled because there's an antitrust uh, dimension to it. Um, Andy and Otko, I couldn't really get a sense of um, of this, of the outcome of this, whether they're going to win this or lose it. Um, can you do us the favor of just encapsulating what this lawsuit is actually about, and then maybe give us your uh, sense of, of whether Apple's going to have to actually pay that billion dollars. Uh, it's that's the thing with like lawsuits with Apple. They're they're fighting so many battles on so many fronts. You kind of have to. It's it's like uh, you can't follow every single sports team. You kind of cheer for the one that you really really like. So I'm I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the interconference scrabbling between Apple and Samsung and Apple and the book industry. Uh, when it when it when it comes to this thing about uh, about antitrust stuff on music players, I really don't know what the where, what the real beef is. Um, there's uh, I, I, I have to absolutely admit that this is one of those things that makes my eyes glass over a little bit. Yeah, and, and Serenity Caldwell, one of the interesting things about this is that, uh, of course, um, Steve Jobs is going to testify, sort of. Uh, he's actually going to be a, a video, a deposition of, of Steve Jobs himself, uh, which was recorded uh, f probably four years ago, something like that, uh, is going to be played in court. And, uh, you know, it's gonna, I, I think we're all looking forward to seeing it. Uh, he's probably going to be very persuasive, as he always is. And, uh, you know, it's, but it's just kind of a weird uh, aspect to this that Steve Jobs is testifying. Yeah, you know, uh, I think it's funny that, you know, Steve probably in his, in his infinite wisdom is like, you know what, on the off chance that we get sued, I'm just going to make a bunch of video testimonials and I'll be <laughs> extremely compelling in all of them. No, but the... Um, I believe the video is of of boardroom meetings or something along those lines where he's talking about the various plans for the iPod um, and about crushing competitors, which, of course, the um, this lawsuit has taken to meaning, oh, well, the iPod is clearly, you know, antitrust and its goal is to, you know, make sure there are no other competitors in the music space. And I <coughs> don't know. I mean, not having seen the videos myself and maybe they'll leak out after after the court testimony. Um, I'm I'm skeptical. To uh, to believe that um, what Jobs was actually like in the ebook, uh, uh, the ebook antitrust suit, I'm not necessarily sure what he was saying is let's crush all the competitors. More like we have a better product and we're going to make it the best product in his traditional Steve Jobs way. Yeah. Now whether that will be helpful or harmful for this case, we we shall see. I suppose it's yeah. also weird. It's also uh, go ahead, go ahead, Andy. I'm I'm just saying also also this is this is where like non lawyers like myself this is this is why our, our eyes glass over. A lot of the things that are sort of key to this particular suit are the idea that for a time you had to if you wanted to if you wanted music that worked with iPods, you had to buy music from Apple. And so does that to us that's more like Maybe we've been beaten down our expectations of having freedom with non-DRM content, but now it's like, well, of course, if I buy a Kindle book, I'm, I guess I'm not going to be able to, I'm not necessarily going to be able to uh, get it on a player that has not been approved by, uh, by, by Kindle. If I buy an iTunes mo movie, I'm going to have to be li limited to Apple TV and the Apple iPhone and the Apple iPad and that sort of stuff. And then you have to wonder, well, why is the government so worried about it? And I, this, this is why, I, like I said before, my eyes kind of glass over because 
I don't know at this point the difference between something that we are we should simply accept because this is the way that business wants to do business and something that the government really does say, no, 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 we're here to defend you by saying you shouldn't you shouldn't uh, tolerate that sort of stuff from happening. <laughs> and the other <laughs> pardon me. And the other reason why your eyes glass over is that you know that even if things come down, uh, a judgment comes down on the side of the consumers, it's going to be something like we suddenly get a, a credit for a dollar and seventy three cents appear magically in our account, and like, well, congratulations! That's that's that was the result of all this lawyers and all this gas being burned to uh, photocopy documents and get that positions. Dollar and seventy three cents, go nuts. It's also it's it's kind of um, you know it's it's weird, of course, that Steve Jobs is is going to make an, a a sort of virtual appearance in all this. But it's it's no less weird that the subject matter of this is this whole topic about music players and iPods and and uh, lock in for iTunes Music and so on. It's it's almost as if uh, you know Microsoft were going to court today uh, to defend you know to defend itself against charges that it's. Uh, dominance in Windows is allowing it to maintain its dominance with the Internet Explorer browser, and uh, <laughs> and then they're all going to go to court and figure out this uh, this is issue once and for all. It's the the whole thing is gone. It's over, and it's just a question of whether you know people get that dollar and change in their accounts. And so yeah, it, it is a it is a, a bizarre thing that should uh, make everybody's eyes uh, glaze over, not just the non lawyers. It's also <laughs> something that I I, I I I'm glad that some of the stuff that I might have like posted on my blog or like written about like in the uh, in the 1990s back when uh, the government might have might possibly have broken Microsoft into uh, separate uh, units for their uh, operating system division, their application division, and their services divisions because they're just so powerful and it was incorrect for them to create an ecosystem in which their own products work together better than an outside product would and I'm sure that I, I was also like you know, 15, 20 years younger then. And so maybe 20, 21, 22 year old Andy would have said, you know, this is exactly what needs to happen because Microsoft wants to control everything and do everything. But now like I'm Andy in my forties and saying that, okay, I'm not necessarily saying it's a good thing that I can't, I, I, I can't buy this copy of the Lego movie and play it anywhere. But you know, Apple does such a wonderful, per, wonderful job with its iCloud integration to make sure that syncing between devices works so very, very well. And <laughs> it's like, it's, you, you just don't know what's real what's unreal anymore and i don't even know like whether the blue pill or the red pill is the one that i'm supposed to take to get back to reality i well uh, i'm as far as i'm concerned i don't want to remember nothing nothing serenity you had a comment oh just you know the the fact again like you were saying mike about the internet explorer days um ipods you know were locked in primarily because of uh, hardware issues you know when you're talking about early syncing problems. We all remember how uh, how much fun it was to sync early iPods and early music players to your computer. Uh, whereas now, I mean, there's a, there's a reason why this lawsuit is capped at like 2008, 2009, because once the App Store was introduced and everything else, like, yes, you have the option to buy from the iTunes Music Store, but you also have apps like Amazon Music, where you maybe not necessarily can buy directly, but you can get your music downloaded. You can put your music on Dropbox. You can have your music accessible via Google Play. You can stream it off of YouTube. Like these, these concerns uh, are now no longer concerned. So it's not like, so, you know, it's not like this lawsuit is stop the big bad apple that's, you know, keeping us from doing everything that we want to do. I mean, most of those options are available. Alternate options are available to you now. Yep, uh, it's, still, it's still an it's still an interesting principle. Like one of the central things, and uh, one of the reasons why I think this has gone so long is because there's you know, Steve Jobs is known for saying things that are on his mind, and whatever happens, then happens. And there's a conversation between him and Phil Schiller. Is it Phil Schiller? I think where <coughs> I beg your beg your pardon. Um, where they're talking about one of the one of the central like a uh, 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 touch uh, touch match uh, issues here was when real player wanted to get its content on the on the iPod Apple would not let them do that so they found a way to do that they, they simply reverse I don't know if you if this fits the legal definition of reverse engineering but they figured out that hey there's a way that we can actually do that whether Apple wants us to do it or not and then Apple said okay or we can change the way that a computer host computer talks to the iPod to make sure that doesn't work ever again and that's one of the central issues that uh, these suits are are based on and it's an interesting question to ask like is it is it bullying tactics if Apple says this to, what the, this this application that an independent consumer may or may not choose to install that may or may not uh, affect 
the operation of only the hardware that he or she actually owns, should we actually actively move to make sure that that tool is not available to that person? Uh, even though it doesn't seem to be breaking any laws, there's no violation of Digital Millennium uh, Copyright Act, it's not breaking copy protection on anything that we sell, is it bullying to for Apple to say, no, 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 I, we emphatically say that as a consumer, you do not get to use any software on here that we do not approve. And you certainly can't sell software as a company that lets people use our hardware in a way that we did not envision, in a way that we don't approve of. So I think it's a, it's a more interesting debate amongst people like us who talk about this than um, amongst lawyers, because when lawyers get involved, that starts to have knock-on effects that maybe you don't like uh, five or ten years later. But it's, like I was saying earlier, I think it's an interesting issue that things that we thought maybe were incredibly important in the 1990s, we simply accept as the, as the law of the land, simply by virtue of the fact that we like we like the we, we like the good things about the the kingdom that we live in. It's okay if they occasionally catapult people over the moat uh, that we were kind of fond of. Yeah, exactly. And you know, it all you know the the, the companies that are often subject to lawsuits and also antitrust uh, action by the government tend to bristle about it because they understand something that this case actually demonstrates. Something that the, the we, we referred to the Microsoft case in the 90s, uh, uh, that demonstrates it as well, which is that innovation will all, always clobber you anyway. It's not like, you know, it's very, very difficult to get a lock-in unless you're Facebook, in which when you have every social, you know, almost every social network, one-third of the internet users in the world, and it, it's very difficult for the, for them to sort of lose their monopoly, if you want to call it that. But, yeah. but for things like, you know, browsers, uh, you know, music players. I mean, nobody, I don't think, could have predicted the degree to which streaming services would replace the behavior of buying songs and downloading them to the extent that it is happening now and to the extent that it's almost certainly going to happen in the future. That's just the, uh, the, the industry being innovative and moving on with new ways of doing things and people embracing new ways of doing things, uh, invalidating the old sort of lock-in model that, uh, that this case is all about. It's also a big... Uh, uh, question about how you how you slice and dice and categorize things. It, does Apple have a 100% monopoly uh, in uh, iOS uh, market share, or do they have a 50% monopoly in the United States market because the iPhone has uh, something like that in terms of its market share, or do they have a significantly lower market share globally? How do you slice and dice these things? How do you determine w w what the market is uh, and and so on? So it's it's a it's annoying when the when the lawyers get in there and start making the dis these distinctions, but it's it's really I think uh, Apple, as Apple will attest, uh, these these questions are almost always resolved not by antitrust legislation, lawsuits, or or the uh, the government, but by the markets, the innovative uh, competitors, and the users themselves who choose different models for doing things, and so you know that's why these companies have to constantly reinvent themselves. Well, Apple is a is a company in flux, and it's really interesting to see, and it's one of my favorite topics to to sort of look for signs of the new Apple, the new Tim Cook, the warmer, the fuzzier uh, Apple, the less vindictive, the one without the thermonuclear war, that Apple. Uh, and so I think we're seeing another sign of this, and correct me if I'm wrong, Serenity Caldwell, that, you know, in, the, in, in Apple's red campaign, which is where they're, uh, everything that they sold on uh, Cyber Monday yesterday uh, went, uh, all the money raised went to help fight AIDS. And, uh, and an interesting element of this is that they, uh, they're pushing this so hard that they literally pushed a push notification out to people, which caused people to freak out and think, okay, this must be a spear phishing attack or something else. Um, what do you think about this? Is this uh, red campaign a, a sign of an Apple that's more willing to do good things in the world? Or is this just uh, uh, the same old Apple, the, something that's existed before? Yeah, I mean, I really think that, I mean, they've been doing the red campaign for quite a few years now. And this campaign, this, uh, we're going to brand all of our apps red and encourage people to buy apps during uh, during World AIDS Day um, and donate our profits. That's a step above from what they're normally doing. Um, the push notification issue is a little thorny because... On one hand, there's a lot of us who are who are very upset when apps that we buy uh, push notific like send push notifications that are ads, right? You you should buy this uh, in-app purchase or everything is 30% off today. Uh, all of that kind of stuff. That's that's really annoying when you get it from everywhere else. So to say that Apple is immune from that, even when it's for a good cause, is kind of a hard tack to take. But at the same time, I don't think it was meant maliciously, and I don't think it's the harbinger of 
things to come from Apple where they're like, oh, hey, let's use our push notification system for ads all the time. I think that it was probably one or two people in on the App Store team or somewhere in that who were like, oh, you know, it'd be really cool as part of our, you know, promotion of World AIDS Day. Let's make sure that all of our customers really know about it um, and make sure that they understand, you know, this great cause that we're supporting. So it's like it's I don't necessarily think that Apple should continue to use push notifications for ad or charity related reasons. But I like I understand the vein from which they were coming and I don't necessarily think the outrage, the, the subsequent outrage on the internet is, is necessarily justified. It's like, yeah, they, they made a mistake. They made a mistake in concert for a good cause. And now, you know, they've definitely understood that people are maybe not so thrilled with this mistake that they've made. Um, and maybe they won't do it next year for World AIDS Day. And do, do, you, do you see other uh, indications that uh, Apple is getting both warmer and fuzzier? Oh, um, yeah. I mean. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, well, ahead, it, it, it's. Um, I, I just. I just wanted to pick up where uh, where where Cerny was talking about. It's. It's. It's an interesting move for. I, I. I wasn't outraged by it. I just thought it was okay. Well, that's interesting. I've never seen it. Alert like that. I. I think that it's. It is important to note that this isn't an ad so much as this is an extension of Apple's beliefs that we want to and we want to do this. Take this step to promote something that we really really like. Um, also, I think it's also. Important to note that they didn't do it at like 2.20 p.m. on like a business day. It was during a long weekend where pretty much nobody is really using their phones for anything uh, business related or really, really important unless, you know, their car is on fire and they're trying to get 911. So maybe there are exceptions to that. But it's interesting that it, it you could take this as a, a sign that Apple really does see their users as a community of people that have shared beliefs and shared values because Think about how many iPhones there are out there. And everybody in this conversation has a certain number of people who follow them on Twitter, follow them on Google Plus or whatever. And you notice as you as your community grew, you start to notice that things that you could say about, wow, isn't it, isn't it great that uh, that the, the president of the United States like was happening along and pulled that child out of a, out, out of the tree before the leopard got at him. When you have 2,000 followers, people are going to say, yes, isn't it great that that, killed, that kid's life got saved? When you have 2 million followers, they're, you know what? Let's find out how that kid got in that tree to begin with. You know, I don't subscribe to you for political, political propaganda. And so it's interesting when Apple chooses to say we're going to not just simply uh, promote the idea of charity or unified fund. We're going to promote a specific charity. We're going to push that out to all of our users. So I, I do think that it is a sign that somewhere inside Apple, there are people that still think that everybody who has bought an Apple device did it because they have a sort of shared values thing going on with the company and with all other Apple users. Yeah, that's a great point. And uh, we are actually joined by another third panelist. With us right now is Allison Sheridan. Welcome to you, Allison. Hey, Mike. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic. It's very nice to meet you. I have also never been on a podcast or a netcast with you and so i'm very glad uh to have you on thank you so much for coming on that happened at the last That's minute yeah you're with the uh the nozilla cast mac podcast can you tell us about that podcast yeah it's uh my tagline is a technology geek podcast with an ever so slight macintosh bias in other words like a giant mac bias but yep. uh, but i cover a lot of other tech stuff in fact uh this uh, sunday is my 500th show wow yeah. That, is, that is fantastic. Well, congratulations and welcome to you. And I, I'm so glad you're here to join us. Now we have a, a true quorum here on uh, <laughs> We Mac can Break call Weekly. it a panel. Yeah, exactly. And so um, I want to launch into this next story because it's really interesting. I, I've always been fascinated by Apple's uh, eBooks initiative and their, the, the, the litigation that they're dealing with. And Eddie Q actually had an interview with Fortune uh, this week where he talked about the need for Apple to fight for the truth, he says. And he, said, and he said that Tim feels exactly the way he does, but they have to fight for the truth, fight for their principles, because it's the right thing to do. I think that price fixing is not normally viewed as fighting for the truth, but I think they do have a point. And I think the larger point, of course, is that Amazon is the dominant ebook player. They have a lock on the market. They do all kinds of things that smell and taste uh, and a competitive, which is that they sometimes sell ebooks at below the price that they paid for them. Uh, and they uh, tend to be very, very dominant. Uh, and I think Apple is trying to figure out a way where publishers and and the uh, and and the company that delivers them, i.e., Apple, gets paid a reasonable amount for uh, books. 
Um, do you think that uh, Eddie Q's um, sort of missionary zeal is uh, well placed here and that it will help uh, Apple in any way deal with this uh, litigation that they're facing? I, I'm sorry, are you directing me or? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. That that that. Uh, go ahead, Andy. You already started talking. I'm going to go around the the horn on this one, but let's start with you, Andy. Sorry, go ahead. I mean, leap leap in. Um, I think I think it really does point to how Apple does seem that is like one of the few companies that can take things personally. Like uh, it's not when uh, uh, when uh, Google uh, revised Android in response to the iPhone. It wasn't a case of one company creating a. A product to designed to be more competitive with a su successful other product. It was Google has screwed us over. We trusted Google, and this is what Google did. We, we Google has made a powerful enemy today. And when you look at this antitrust thing, it seems uh, it seems to be mostly based not on. Uh, when, when, I think that when Ed Q uh, made that made that statement, I think he was talking more about how uh, the judge who heard this case concluded that Apple had co had colluded with publishers to fix prices when in reality they were just getting the iBook store off the ground one interesting new quote from this uh, <clears throat> from from all this is that it's not as though the iPad and I and the iBook store were packaged together from the very beginning as hey if we do a tablet we, doesn't it doesn't make sense for us to start selling books in the in the iTunes store no it was Eddie Q who said who puts who puts together all these deals for for content who basically came to Steve uh, Jobs when uh, the iPad was in development and said hey we, here's an opportunity here and one quote from the article is that Steve said well we're not going to we're not going to delay the iPad for this but see what you can put together which makes it seem like this is just let's see what we can do just in time to get this time with with Luis for the iPad and so i think that what Eddie is saying here, I could be wrong, is that he's saying that, no, look, you, you, you went after these publishers because there was a good documented trail of them colluding together to try to provide a united front against Amazon. Uh, you, you're throwing us in with them when actually they did all that before we even got seriously interested in the ebook business. And so we want to defend the truth that we did not join a big cabal to try to fix prices. Now, whether or not that's actually true, whether or not whatever they did apart in, on their own was price fixing or not, that might be something that's going to be discussed uh, in a week or two when uh, when uh, this is this case is reheard. Uh, but it is, I do think that's that's so typically Apple, and I think in a positive way that they they do feel as though they are one living organism with a heart and a brain and the ability to get offended and hurt. And when they get hurt, they try to say, "Hey, man, what's up? what was that?" What was that? You know, yeah. you, if, when you cut me, do I not bleed? Well, no, I don't because I'm a corporation, but still, metaphorically. <laughs> Corporations are people, Andy. At least that's what the United States wants us to think. That's right. Exactly. You know, Andy, part of what you said there at the very end where you said whether or not that ends up being true, isn't it probably true that anybody going into a, a lawsuit like this or, or almost any kind of court battle believes that what they know is the truth? I mean, it almost seems obvious mm -hmm. that he say, we're defending the truth. Oh, no, the other guys, they think they're lying and they're defending lies. That's probably what nobody thinks, right? Exactly. I it, well, I, I don't know. It, it, it's the um, sometimes you feel it's like you get pulled over. You know, you were speeding. OK, there's no way that I was doing 65 on that downhill straight away late at night with no other cars mm -hmm. on the road. There's no way I was doing 65. But you know that. The game's over if I say, yes, officer, I was definitely speeding. I wasn't even paying attention to the speedometer, but the the, the trees behind me were complete brownie in motion, a, a complete Doppler blur uh, for, into, the, into, into the red there. So whatever you say that I speed, sped at, that's the ticket you're going to have to write for me. You're going to say, no, officer, I don't know why you pulled me over. And you're gonna. It's it's even if even if they said you know there's a, there's a lot of leeway and what could, what we might have done something that uh, that fits the uh, the colloquial version of price fixing. I mean yes, we talked to these people and the, then we encouraged those people to talk to those people and then we all agreed to do this. Versus we did something that fits the legal definition of price fixing. Like I did not have relations with that woman. <laughs> nope. I well that when the truth comes out. How do you define relations? There you go. So I didn't lie. I just simply said something that I knew that I could defend. Depends on what the well, definition of is is. Um, but Serenity, you had, you had a comment on that? I was going to say, it's the it's the Obi-Wan Kenobi philosophy. It's like what I told you was true from a certain point of view. You have to you have to believe that you're, if you're defending a case, you have to, you have to have a narrative that you strongly believe in the, because it's or, very... Or the, 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 John, the, the, uh, the, the, the Costanza defense. Now remember, Jerry, it's not a lie... If you, you believe, believe it, it, it should be true. <laughs> yep. No, exactly. Love a Seinfeld uh, reference. 
But yeah, you know, just just, just, just to zero in on exactly what Apple is saying, and that, you know, to a certain extent, almost all aspects of their of this whole scenario on Apple's uh, uh, part is is very acceptable. So you know, the the first the first aspect of it is that. Uh, Amazon is very dominant, and there has to be some way for other players to compete with Amazon when Amazon is bringing prices down to a point where nobody's making any money. Okay, that's acceptable. We can all accept that. So, uh, so Apple comes forward with saying, "Hey, we'll just have our regular agency model, the same one we have for apps and everything else. Essentially, you can, you the publisher, can choose any price you like, and then you give us our massive cut, and and then we make money, you make money, you get to determine the price." Not, not us. At, you know, Amazon determines the price of of Amazon eBooks, uh, and, and Apple's saying we're we're going to provide an alternative to that model. I think everybody can accept that that is a perfectly above board uh, thing to do. And then, the price fixing part is when they said, but once you've selected a price, you can't sell that same eBook elsewhere, i.e., Amazon.com, for a lower price than the one that's available on, you know, through through Apple's, yes. you know, uh, and so. And that's that, the price that, fixing part, and 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 that, that, that's where the def, def, definition of is is because, again, according to the Forbes article, uh, uh, Q's statement was that look, this we that was when uh, that was like a draft version of something that we were doing, and we quickly swapped away from that to something else that 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 because we felt as though th that language, whether it was legal or not, didn't even would not even achieve what we wanted to achieve. So that's so so a lot of it really is here what the timeline is they they're also they also seem to uh sorry the people the prosecutors also seem to uh again tinge on things that Steve Jobs tended to say like after shortly after the iPad announcement again quoting from the uh from the Forbes article that uh as, it, as Steve was being asked like well uh, I think it was uh, by Walt Mossberg uh, that gee but Steve you know you're charging your the iBook store is charging $15 for the same book that Amazon is charging $10 for who is going who's going to be buying this book for $5 more and Steve said soon all the prices will be the same <laughs> I realized that he was he's a tenor he's a tenor not a baritone but there's the same ominous sort of it's, it also sounds bad Andy are I, I'm not a lawyer, and neither are you, so I'll just ask you directly. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know whether they're allowed to bring up anything about uh, what's going on with the Hachette case and all that with, uh, I guess it's not a case, but with uh, Amazon? I mean, that sort of seems really interesting in this context, but probably has nothing to do with what happened in the past. I don't know. I mean, we're 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 both we're both non lawyers, which means that we can go we can go hog wild in speculation. <laughs> Make stuff up. Uh, I don't. I I, th I I don't think that they would be able to say, well, here's something that happened three years later with parties that had nothing to do with Apple or the other publishers. A quick look so, over there. They're yeah. being bad. <laughs> hey, we just pushed out an ad that helps helps AIDS patients. Come on, could we do anything bad? <laughs> and, and just look to, how thin the new iPad is, Judge. <laughs> this, this should get us all kinds of credit in, in court. Uh, just, oh, so yeah. just to review the Hachette case, essentially what what happened there is that Amazon was accused of of bullying tactics. Essentially, they negotiate with publishers to get to figure out what the price is that Amazon pays uh, for the books that they are then going to sell. This is not the the price. That they weren't negotiating the price that Amazon is going to sell Hachette books at. That's none of Hachette's business as far as Amazon is concerned. It's the price that Amazon is going to pay. And, of course, they have these negotiations all the time. They have to in order to establish a contract for providing the e-books the e and so on. And uh, Amazon wanted, it, apparently, an ex unacceptably low price. Uh, there was protracted negotiations, and Amazon wanted to squeeze. This is the this is the critical version uh, of Amazon. I'll give you the Amazon version in a minute. But uh, the, the the critical version is that Amazon tried to sque squeeze Hachette by starting to uh, st you know stop making uh, certain titles available on Amazon.com. You couldn't pre-order uh, upcoming books uh, from Hachette. You couldn't you know they, they were starting to squeeze them literally their bottom line that the income that was coming through Amazon to to Hachette. And it was an effective tactic. Uh, people cried foul. A bunch of authors wrote a nasty gram to the Amazon board of directors. And uh, this kind of thing feels anti-competitive. Now, the Amazon's point of view was that, hey, we, we weren't sure that we were going to actually be able to ink a deal with Hachette. So why would we have pre-orders for books that, we, we, that, that are in an uncertain state? Uh, they had, you know, language like that. And they also said, you know, ultimately, we're all about uh, embracing literacy. 
uh, literacy uh, is enhanced when books are very cheap. And we are there for the reader and the consumer driving down the prices of, of e-books so that everybody can afford to read and have the gift of literacy, et cetera. But Amazon does many, many things that feel anti-competitive and sort of uh, using its monopoly, close to monopoly, whatever you want to call their dominance in the e-book publishing market, and also their dominance in, in the online uh, print book uh, market, uh, to, to, to actually... Um, essentially turn the screws on the, the publishing companies, that feels anti-competitive, but it isn't really. It's not against the law. There's, they're, they're selling books at below cost. Feels anti-competitive, but it's only illegal if you do it internationally. It doesn't, it, it, there's nothing against the law about it if you do it internally. You can lose all the money you want. And, and so... Um, that starts me making me wonder. I was thinking about it when I got uh, something from Amazon today and I was like, oh, I only asked for it yesterday and it came instantly. And I just have this vision that one day after Amazon has dominated absolutely everything, then they're going to go, okay, now we're going to actually start charging what it really costs. And all of a sudden, just everything goes up 20% because it's just too good to be true right there, now. There were some reports that, in fact, that has happened in certain academic markets where they were able to turn the screws to a certain extent and establish a monopoly on that through low price, but undercutting everybody so nobody else can make money, the prices then went way up. That's a report uh, that was controversial. That's not a, an absolute statement on what their intentions are in all markets, but there was a report along those lines. Of course, the, the, the notorious diapers.com uh, situation where they actually have algorithms, they had algorithms that monitored diapers.com prices. They wanted to buy di diapers.com and they were in the diapers, you know, competing with them for diapers. Um, and, um, and and so they, they had this algorithm that would determine whatever the prices were on diapers.com and then undercut it automatically and instantly. Uh, the, the valuation of diapers.com plummeted and then Amazon bought them at a very favorable uh, cost because they just didn't have a business anymore because of Amazon. Uh, and that's another example of, of, of what feels like not entirely fair business practices on the part of Amazon. But again, nothing illegal. Uh, and they're benefiting, you know, uh, the cause of keeping babies uh, from having full diapers by uh, driving down the, pr the price. Some would <laughs> say that they are in the same mothers, condition as yeah. those very diapers. And, but and, 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 I, and I'm sure that's how they explain it to stockholders. Yes. Like, <laughs> you know, it's going to cost us money to do this, but think of the children. Like, yeah. <laughs> At the end of the day, it really comes down to, you know, if there's money being removed from from your pockets, like if you're, if you're being charged only $5 for something that should cost $10, where is that, like that other $5 didn't just magically disappear. It's not like, it's not invisible money that you never had to pay in the first place. Oh, this is what the the the, the book actually costs or the diaper actually costs. Um, that money is being taken away from either the bottom line of a company or the bottom line of the writer who made the book or from the workers who are packaging your 30 pack of diapers. Like Amazon may be dramatically undercutting a lot of prices to basically become dominant in this market. And they may be engaging in semi-shady but pseudo-legal tactics to, to take over companies. But at the end of the day, uh, where like where is this is this missing money being taken from? You know, it's like we've we've all heard <laughs> stories of like the crazy workers and 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 I've heard stories from like from small publishers and small publishing companies and um even bigger publishing companies who are like, yeah, you know, ebooks, ebooks should cost, you know, uh, marginally less than a paper book because of printing costs and all of that. But when you look down to it, printing costs really aren't that much. And the majority of the money that you're paying for a book, whether it's printed or ebook, is to help offset like the promotion and the writer's cost and everything else. And the more money you take away from that, the less we're able to pay writers, which means that writers may not be able to write as many books for us in a year which then, you know, it's it trickles through the entire entire system. Yes, and Eddie Q wants to fix it. Thank you, Eddie Q, for saving us. Uh, Godspeed. Yeah, and, and again, I think like so many of these things, there will be an industry solution um, to all of this. And, uh, you know, there is, there is the case to be made that Amazon is, in fact, making it super easy for authors to get books into the hands of readers at low cost, and that is theoretically a very good thing. Well, in just a sec, we're going to uh, come back and talk about some really interesting Apple patents, including some crazy Apple patents. We're going to find out what they mean and 
when they're going to come to an iPhone near you. Probably never. Uh, and uh, But first, I want to tell you about Squarespace 7. I've been using Squarespace for several years, and I love it. It's so easy to use, uh, and, and it's fantastic for me because I'm not the kind of person who's going to go in there and do programming and uh, have to host my site and so on. Squarespace will do the hosting. They let you build programming-free sites. Now, of course, if you're a programmer, if you're a developer, you can go in there and truly customize, get access to all the code, use their amazing uh, developer tools, including the tools that they use to build the site themselves. Uh, that, that developer platform is now out of beta, so you can use that. But they also have this fantastic, easier-to-use uh, system. And of course, Squarespace 7 is fantastically easy to use. I used to think Squarespace was like incredibly easy to use. Squarespace 7 makes it so much easier because, for starters, you don't have to toggle between the preview mode and the site manager. In other words, you don't have to go uh, back and forth saying, okay, I made some changes. Okay, what does it look like? Let me go find out what that looks like. No, you can see what it looks like right there in the editing space, which is really a seamless, fantastic experience. Uh, you want pictures? You don't want to just go and grab pictures online somewhere. You want to uh, actually have sites that you have permission to use, but you don't want to spend a fortune and you want to use high quality stock photography. So Squarespace now allows you to directly from inside the site, pick find and plug in images from Getty, the stock photography site that is just super, super excellent. It costs just $10 an image, super simple to do uh, and to use. And those, again, are super high quality uh, images. They have fantastic templates. Your website on Squarespace will always look incredible because the designers are Squarespace's amazing designers. And it starts with a template, and if you decide you want to switch to another template later, you're going to swap out the template, and all the stuff that you've done, all the content, the pictures, all the everything in your site will remain the same. You just get the, the shiny new template. And this is really, really a wonderful thing to do. If you ever need help, of course, they have tech support 24-7. They don't they don't uh, send you off to figure it out on your own in some knowledge base somewhere. A human being who knows what they're talking about, who's based in their New York City offices, will answer your question directly. I've used their tech support. I've only had to use it once, uh, in truth. Uh, I had a question. It was answered immediately. They really knew what they were talking about. It was really refreshing to use their tech support, and I really, really appreciate that. Uh, Squarespace sounds super expensive because of the quality of the designs. It sounds expensive because the ease of use that they give you, and it sounds expensive because their hosting is so amazing. You can't bring down a Squarespace site. Even Leo couldn't bring it down by having the Twit Army on Twit on the big Sunday show. He drove everybody, he's done it many times, to Squarespace sites. Nobody can bring these things down because they are they, they throw all the processing power that is needed uh, behind these sites when they are stressed. So it's just a fantastic thing. But it's not expensive, just $8 a month. It starts at just $8 a month, and that includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. What a deal. You can start a free two-week trial with no credit card required. Start building your website. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure you use the offer code MACBREAK. And that'll get you 10% off and show your support for Mac Break Weekly. And to begin using Squarespace 7, if you're already a user, a customer, just go to the settings tab and you can just activate all the fun new stuff. It's not going to activate on its own, so you you, you won't have uh, everything change unless you want it to change. But believe me, you want it to change. The new stuff is really great. So just go to the settings tab and activate those new fe features. And we thank Squarespace for their support of Mac Break Weekly. Squarespace, start here and go anywhere. Well, the steamed panel, uh, Apple's got some new patents, including a wacky patent that will this designed to make your iPhone act like a cat. So when you drop it, it flips around to land on its feet, so to speak. <laughs> it land on the bumper instead of the screen. Uh, it uses the built, it supposedly uses the built-in, I guess it's an actuator for the haptics uh, uh, hardware that's inside uh, iPhones, uh, and it sort of turns itself around. Are they crazy? Will this? Can you, anyone imagine uh, this uh, ever working? I'm actually well, a first mechanical of all, I engineer. Just want to highlight? <laughs> Go ahead, Serenity. Who wins? Oh yeah, I, I just I was just going to make a joke about how that patent looks like the internals of a lightsaber, not a shifting <laughs> iPhone in midair. And I thought that was that was amusing. But I uh, no, I mean I think it's um I think it's a really interesting idea. Um, I, I think uh, that, you know, potentially there might be internals in there, but uh, that can detect falls and, and compensate accordingly. In this small of a package, though, I, I'm not quite sure. You, you want to chime in a little bit more with your electrical engineering uh, background? Uh, not electrical, mechanical, actually. Um, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say was... Mechanical, I think, mechanical, sorry. <clears throat> I think with, uh, with a certain length of time, I could probably figure out how to do this with... Uh, 
you know, the actuator that uh, Mike talked about and, and, you know, all kinds of different components. But making that in the thickness of an iPhone, I, I could probably do it in about a four or five inch thick <laughs> piece of material. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, that's pretty cool. But I don't know, maybe they're going to have um, nanotechnology in there by the time that they get around to actually making something like this. Well, so we got we got a phone that that uh, in the future that's going to be made out of sapphire. The metal parts are going to be liquid metal, according to previous patents. And we're continuing to speculate. Um, I, I think, I, but Alice, I think of, I think you have an interesting idea though. There, like, what if someone were to like let's uh, this would be one a crazy Kickstarter, of course, but to make a uh, a protective case that not only has an extended battery, but also has like higher powered actuators that could do really cool things. Like for instance, actually do give you give you a really good chance at landing uh, if you drop a phone landing it uh, in, a, in a safe way but also things like you could turn it into like a mini Roomba where if you if you <laughs> drop it on the floor you know you don't know where your phone is it won't it won't just find your phone and say your phone your phone it'll <laughs> <laughs> And get closer and closer. It's it. I, well, they've I, got that. I, I, they've got that camera app that lets you stand it down end, yeah. right? That that's yeah, that rotates three hundred. 60 degrees, yeah. And it's, and yeah. it's like magical, too. I, I would I would have, when I saw it, I would have expected just just like vibrate, just like sort of turn around like randomly, like one of those old like football players, one of those like old uh, tabletop football games. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's like, no, it's like turn 10 degrees, take the picture, turn 10 degrees. It's like, <laughs> that's spooky, man. And I, I, I want to see phones that have interesting, weird features like that. I don't, oh, I would, I would love it if that's, if that were something that Apple were to demonstrate at a keynote someday. I've got it. I've got it. What was that game when we were little kids that was like, it wasn't Rock'em Sock'em Robots, but it was around that time area where the little robots would kind of go like this and, go zzz and bash yeah, each yeah. other? Yeah, yeah. It was like, yeah. I, it was, that, was, that was before my time too, but it was like bash. some sort of vibrating like metal plate. And so football players just sort of like, you know, yeah, yeah, and football, but right. wherever they stopped. Yeah. Now we could have our iPhones doing it. I, I have the feeling I that, that I, I thought that, well, I always thought that maybe there's an opportunity for a game developer because like maybe this is, this is the, the time for this has passed because it would have worked better with like actual pocket pages that have really powerful buzzers. But what if we have like a bar top football game where everybody puts their own personal pagers on the table and by sending text messages, like uh, by, by paging yourself, you can basically have the pass plays run and, uh, and it would, it costs you like one dollar per play, but uh, AT and T would be very happy about it. And if you manage to get the peanut on top of your on top of your your, your Motorola pager to the end of the table for anybody else, there you go. You win a free beer. Uh, Andy, Andy, you really got to come to Silicon Valley and launch a company. You just you. Why you've is got my such genius wasted ideas. on the East Coast? Good yes. heavens! Yeah, I know. It's, I, it's, it's, it's the loss to society that I worry about, not any monetary gain that I might be missing out on. Of course not, Andy. Of course not. <laughs> So, so I've always believed that Apple is going to get into haptics in big time. Ever since uh, a few years ago, I saw a uh, a demo. I, f I, I experienced a demo uh, by Immersion. Uh, Immersion is a company that makes haptics technology. I think it's the leading uh, company uh, that does haptics. And in this demo, they had a tablet. It was a, at the time an ordinary uh, tablet in terms of thickness and size and so on. And they had a pinball game on it. And they had the you know as the ball rolled around, you just really felt the the vibration of the ball rolling and the and the the little the the bumpers going ding 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 and clanging and stuff like that and you 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 felt everything it was it was just really shocking how much could be conveyed how much uh, sort of content and 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 how believable it was uh, this pinball game because of the haptics interface and I thought well this is just a matter of time before this is going to happen and now we're starting to see some really interesting things happening in haptics in the Apple Watch which, you know, they're calling it the Taptics engine, but essentially, uh, according to, and, and maybe, Andy, you, you experienced this yourself, they, there's an interface where if you tap on the watch, then you can, it feels like somebody's tapping on your wrist, and it doesn't feel like yeah. something buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. It feels like somebody's tapping on your wrist. I mean, it feels almost directional. It feels uh, very natural, and that's in the smartwatch. So you got to believe that the iPhone of the future, the iPhone 8, or something is going to have some pretty sophisticated haptics that may have multiple haptics uh, actuators in different parts of the phone, and that sort of uh, and this is you know wildly speculative, but that sort of thing could be enough to really turn a phone around or do other uh, amazing magical things. But it certainly would be great for gaming, and in fact, turn a uh, an iPhone into something more like a, an Xbox controller. Yeah. Apple Apple is in a uh, in a uh, difficult situation in that they're the only makers of iPhones and they can really only make two or three models. So if they decide to do something like as bizarre and weird and 
ultimately destined to fail like the Fire Phone. Like that would be one third of all the iPhones they manufacture would fail. Uh, but haptics are great. It's it's something that every time I test out like an Android phone, I really enjoy because almost every Android phone uses haptics in the keyboard. And uh, you might want to turn it on or turn it off or set, dial it in when you get your new phone. But believe me, if you're in a noisy environment and you're not really sure if you're making, quote, contact, unquote, with a certain button or a certain key pr press you're trying to make, the fact you get a reassurance that, yes, I, I do recognize that you did press this button. I'm telling you that you can now lift your finger off of this. It's just a nice little bit of reassurance. Uh, partic and, and things like when you are when you boot up and it reassures you, that, okay, I'm, I'm alive right now. Everything worked out fine. Uh, it's just another way to have this hardware communicate with the user. And once you get above like baby, like just cries and growls and shrieks and you elevate the haptics to communication, boy, what an opportunity that is. And uh, yeah, I, uh, the Apple watch, uh, I was only like everybody else. I was only experiencing like a canned like demo. It was just programmed to go through whatever motions it was programmed to go through. It didn't feel like it was, amazingly subtle like like a you know like it was communicating anything other than it's buzzing and it's buzzing in a different way now uh, but even that just the ability to do nothing like a, there's a i, I used uh, uh, since we're talking about watches and haptics i installed like a new thing on uh, my moto 360 just two days ago that i forgot about until today uh, about an hour ago when i went uh, i was uh, i was uh, cleaning uh, cleaning upstairs and i went downstairs to make uh, to make uh, make uh, make lunch and suddenly like my watch buzzes and i you know, where's my watch buzzing and it warns me that hey did you leave your phone behind somewhere because i just lost contact with your phone uh, and that's the purpose of this thing so if you leave your phone like in a bar or uh, or in, in a sofa cushion or whatever it will but as soon as it loses contact so as soon as you're about 10 or 15 feet away from it it will say hey by the way, take, you know, I don't know if it's there's something going on here, but maybe you want to know about that. It's such a cool thing to put, particularly on a watch that's designed to alert you to something that you need to know about right away, as opposed to, okay, I guess this, the, this buzzing in my pocket means that I might have gotten a Gmail or email, email from any one of 400 different people. I'm not going to even bother with it. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 speaking of the the Apple Watch, there's been some new reports coming out that have been kind of shocking some people because I think a lot of people are kind of on the fence about whether the Apple Watch is going to have any sort of market success at all. And uh, and and now there there are different reports. One of them is from UBS's Steve Milinovich, who says that uh, one out of ten iPhone owners are going to are very likely to buy an Apple Watch when it comes out, I think, within the first year or something like that. And uh, that adds up to millions, dozens of millions of Apple Watches being sold in the first year. Um, uh, Serenity, uh, let's start with you. Do you buy this? Do you think, the just based on your gut feeling and what you know about uh, the Apple fan base, do you think that people are going to be gobbling up these expensive uh, and probably unnecessary peripherals? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, and I, I don't even necessarily know if they're unnecessary, perhaps, um, in that we've, I mean, now that WatchKit is available for developers, we have some idea of what the first six to eight months of the watch is going to look like. Um, and for people who want more subtle notifications, for people who want um, basically a way to connect with their phone without necessarily having to have it in front of their face at all times, um, the Apple Watch actually seems like a really useful piece of technology. And the possibilities for it, including the haptics engine and everything else, as we we discussed, I think are are actually um, boundless uh, as soon as, especially watch kit, you know, is fairly limited um, in terms of what developers would be able to do. It basically acts as an extension for your current iPhone apps. But uh, once full-fledged watch apps are able to be developed, which, you know, we're hearing rumors of that later in 2015, maybe WWDC area. Um, I, I really do think that there's a market for the Apple Watch and I'm not at all surprised. I mean, it's not, you know, this survey does not says does not say one in 10 owners very likely to buy an uh, Apple Watch edition, like a specialty <laughs> $5,000 Apple Watch. These are people, the majority of these people are probably looking at the, you know, the 349 base model, Apple, probably the Apple Sport, right? And, um, and for a lot of people, I think the Apple Sport will be more than enough for, for people's needs. And I, I don't know, I just, I feel very positive about the Apple Watch. I got a chance to play with it in the hands-on demo area when, when they premiered it. Um, back a few months ago, and uh, I like even even with the completely canned demonstration, it's a very beautiful piece of technology. It's the first watch 
base, you know, watch style uh, mobile computing that I've ever considered getting. And I, you know, I played with the Pebble and I've, I've played with the Moto, you know, and I, I've played with a bunch of these and, and none of them actually sort of sparked for me the way that the Apple watch has. Yeah. Allison, you know, I remember when the, uh, when the iPhone first uh, was announced and then shipped in 2007, uh, January and then summer, I think, respectively. And at the time I was a, I was a naysayer. I, <laughs> and it's, hilarious now the my my main beef against the iphone was that it was too big uh because i had a i had a blackberry pearl and it was like about the size of a box of chiclets and it was tiny and i thought you know that is yeah it's a big screen and stuff but who cares it's it's boring and then sometime after that what was it a year later or less than a year later they came out with the app store and all the apps and i started seeing what the apps could do and i think like millions of people i started to can sort of my whole view of what the iPhone was, was completely transformed because of the apps. And I think, uh, I think that's what Serenity is saying here. That once the developers get their uh, hands on, you know, the, the kit that came out recently and build some apps and you see what is actually, uh, what this thing is actually going to be used for, it's going to really spark people to get excited about it, talk about it, share that's the it. information. It'll be viral. Uh, do, you, do you buy that argument or do you think it's, it's going to mm -hmm. land with a thud? Well, you actually said almost exactly what I was thinking. I, I when they when they talk about what the Apple Watch is, I think that we aren't going to know what it is until the developers tell us what it is. Now, unfortunately, they're going along the same path where they're saying that these first apps that come out have to just be tied to an iPhone app. And I understand the reasons behind that, but I don't think we're going to really know what it is until the apps are completely opened up. I mean, like you said, with the phone, we thought it was a phone. But when's the last time you made a phone call with it? You know, it, almost everything we do with our iPhones and especially with the iPad, and the iPad is perfect example of uh, an unnecessary thing, right? Nobody needed it. We didn't need it. I didn't need it. Why was I going to need that? Now I can't live without it. So, but it was the developers, not necessarily Apple, who showed me why I needed it and 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 taught me what it was supposed to do. So I'm I'm not maybe quite as bullish as, as Serenity is on it. I feel pretty good though that when the developers show us what it can be, that's when we're going to go, oh, it's not a watch. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I think another component is going to be, I think it will be a lot like the launch of the iPhone where uh, we forget that uh, it sold maybe 10 million in its first, it, it really didn't start becoming a phenomenon for about a, until about a year after it. And I think that's not just because the App Store came about and they it was refined and they, uh, they were able to improve some of its uh, original limitations, but also because there were now about 5 million people with iPhones that could everybody knew someone or knew someone who knew someone who had an iPhone who could explain, gee, why is this, why would I want a phone that doesn't have any buttons on it? Uh, and I think, I think that uh, smartwatches are pretty much the same thing. I wind up inadvertently evangelizing wearables wherever I go. Cause when see, someone sees, when someone sees like a blank, my blank watch and suddenly it lights up and here's a picture of a squirrel with a time on it. Uh, they say, is that one of those smartwatches? How do you like it? And then I will say, well, I love it a lot. And here's how I use it. And here's what I thought was going to be, that wasn't going to work, but boy, does it work great. And here, every time I travel, I do this and look, Hey, look what it just told me right now. And then that leaves them thinking that, gee, it's, it's not, it's, it's a difficult thing to understand in the abstract, especially given that there has never been a product like this before but once you wind up working with somebody who has one it goes from a cursory five or ten minute demo to a month later casually asking hey do you still like that to four months or a year later you're really now about 10 10 cents away from actually wanting to actually buy it and now okay steve you're gonna have to tell me what do you what don't you like about it? What do you ever have any regrets? I think it really is wearing people down over the first year, and part of that is going to be, as Allison said, once developers are able to populate it and really emphatically show you what it does, besides uh, encouraging you to move around uh, and how it will enhance your life. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, I think one of the unanswered questions is uh, with the pricing. Uh, you see uh, reports that uh, the gold version, the edition version, is going to be four, five, six thousand dollars uh, somewhere in there. That's a lot of money. And then the even three fifty is kind of a lot. I'm worried yeah, about that. Yes, yeah, <laughs> exactly. That if that that's where it starts, and that's not even with sapphire. That's with aluminum and so on. But at the very high end, the gold edition, and the, the watch nerds would chime in and say, "Oh, that's nothing. For, people pay a lot more than that for gold watches. They pay ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars for gold watch." Yes, but the problem is that they buy a watch at those prices because they're going to hand it down to their great grandkids on their deathbed. Take my watch, you know, it's like that kind of thing. Whereas the Apple Watch is going to be obsolete in Your a year father and a half. Your father 
smuggled this out of Vietnam. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. So we were talking about um, over at Imor, we were talking about ways for um, this not to be so much of a problem, which is to say, like, if you're paying five thousand dollars for an Apple Watch, how might the majority of those components stay in your in your hands, especially if you're going to do things like engraving, for instance, on a ten thousand five thousand dollar watch. Um, and one of the one of the major thoughts was something where the internal chip is actually replaceable, whereas you know that the screen is going to be retina quality for that size for the thirty for the forty two and thirty eight I want to say millimeter um, screens of the watches. Um, so you know the screens maybe not going to get need to get so much better for a couple of years yet unless you really want to cram a four K display into a three hundred pixel device. Um, <laughs> So Lawrence the, of Arabia on your wrist. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Oh, man, those sand dunes look amazing. No, I mean, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, if there was, if Apple figures out a way to just basically like, oh, yeah, we just take off, we take it to an Apple store, we take off the back panel, and for $100, we'll replace your, you know, A8X mobile chip with a A10. And then all of a sudden, you have all of the new fancy things, and you still have the majority of your five thousand dollar beautiful watch chain and beautiful watch body and personally engraved message about your, you know, your family crest or something like that, um, which is, you know, keeping in line with traditional watchmaking as well. When you think about, you know, how watches are repaired, they're not, you know, it's not just throw away the entire thing, get a new watch. If you have a really nice watch, you go to a watch repair shop and they, you know, they take it apart and they put in little batteries and they, you know, tweak with it. So I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like that's, that a, that's a fun, potential Serenity. Option. That sounds really fun, Serenity. But do you, do you think that sounds like Apple to do that, to not encourage us just to buy another one? I mean, I think the problem is Apple has never really sold a $10,000 machine unless you count like a souped up Mac Pro. Um, and 20th I, anniversary. And I, yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> You know, I mean, I really, it's a very different market that they're getting into. And they've okay. already acknowledged yeah. some, you know, they've acknowledged that they they know they're getting into a different market by the way that they've been courting the fashion industry and by, you know, taking on fashion industry advisors. I don't know if that's actually how it works, but I feel like it might be a good way, you know, it might, it may be one of the things where... Either she's having something that I'd like to have, or Skype is freaking Slowing out again. Her down. <laughs> well, Sorry about that, Serenity. I, I think Skype is uh, not your friend today. I think a point she made was uh, I just got what she was saying was that maybe the addition, you can do that, but the sport, you wouldn't be able to swap it out. You wouldn't be able to swap exactly. out the components. That might be, I, now I see where you're going with it. Yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in just a second, we're going to come back and talk about an area, two areas actually. Where, Google, where Apple is getting its butt handed to them by Google, maybe. Uh, we'll talk about it and figure out what is going on exactly. But first, I want to tell you about NatureBox, one of our sponsors today. NatureBox is a fantastic uh, product uh, for health and for better living because they're delicious snacks. We all like to snack. And I think one of the reasons we like to snack is that, you know, when we're relaxing, when we're at home, just, you know, watching TV or around the house doing whatever, we don't really feel like going through a big chore of making a healthy meal, going through all that kind of stuff. We just want to grab something that's, you know, that's maybe a little sweet, a little salty or whatever that's delicious and just, uh, just eat it between meals. We all like to do it. We're all going to do it. Let's face it. And oftentimes most snacks are just not good for you. They have trans fats. They have way too much salt, way too much sugar. They have unhealthy ingredients and they, they're really nothing good for you. And that's why Nature Box is so fantastic because it's super, super easy for you to go ahead and do what you're going to do anyway except you have healthy food. Like here's an example, Lone Star Snack Mix. These are delicious uh, with a flavor the size of Texas. Uh, these are really uh, amazing. And one of the fun things about NatureBox, by the way, before I get into what's innovative about this company, is the fact that their, their flavors are always so shocking. So they have uh, uh, blueberry nom noms, all kinds of uh, really innovative flavors. When, and sometimes when you hear it, you're like, wait, I've never really heard that flavor combination ever. Uh, how could that possibly be good? And then you try it and it's absolutely fantastic. But here's the innovative part about uh, Nature Box. Basically what you do is you can just get a complimentary trial box. You just pay $2 for shipping and they will send you a trial box to your house or to your place of work if you, if you want to have it come to work. And you just try 
the, the, the various things that they send you. And then you go to the website, and if you decide to sign up and subscribe to subscription snack service, essentially, uh, you can go in there and say, you know what? I really like these two, but I didn't like this one. And they'll send you those two again in the future, and then they'll send you another one to surprise you in the future. And they have so many different uh, flavors and different styles and so on. They have uh, apple pie oak clusters, uh, sea salt, cracked pepper, pumpkin seeds, uh, all kinds of things. Many of these are dried fruits or nuts. Many of them are granola-type things. There's just so many different uh types of snacks that you can, that you can get they're fantastic and they got zero artificial flavors zero artificial colors no artificial sweeteners zero grams of trans fats no high fructose corn syrup and you can even find snacks with no added sugar and without gluten gluten free snacks uh, if you like you can choose your dietary preferences uh, whether you're vegan or whatever it is and you just go in there to the website it's a it's a modern service so you can go in there and optimize and customize exactly what you want to get and then you know they send you stuff and you over time you'll just i guarantee you as we have right uh, here in twit in the break room you'll discover your favorites and you're really going to be thrilled because they have snacks you've never ever even heard of so i passed some of these out to the studio audience here what do you think what do you think of nature box they're good yeah very good okay so the reviews are coming in uh I'm thumbs up all the way too, around mike I'm What's hungry that? over here. I, I would really like some of that nature box. We'll fax you some right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> It's some of the flatter uh, snacks. Well, start your free trial today. Start your trial today and get a complimentary sampler box at naturebox.com slash twit. Stay full, stay strong, start snacking smarter. Go to naturebox.com slash twit. And we thank Naturebox for their support of Mac Break Weekly. And I thank Naturebox for your delicious snacks. I eat them all the time. And I really appreciate the fact that they are healthy. Well, you know, Apple has uh, a former hobby. Uh, now they're very serious about Apple TV. And this is an area like the uh, sort of, I guess, the iPad area where Google is kind of encroaching on the territory with lower cost alternatives that are, in many cases, uh, found to be maybe superior by a lot of uh, consumers. So let's start with Apple TV. Uh, uh, the market researcher Parks Associates uh, is reporting that Apple is losing ground to Chromecast and also Roku in the first three quarters of 2014. Uh, the Chromecast, of course, is a very cheap, I think, what is it, $35 or something like that. It's a little mm -hmm. dongle uh, that plugs in your TV and just lets you stream stuff from your device. Very easy to use, very friendly. It's a great stocking stuffer, as I think Leo said uh, on Twit uh, over the weekend. It's a very compelling offering, whereas Apple TV is kind of feeling kind of old and busted. Uh, these days, they're really not updating it like people expected them to. <clears throat> so let's let's talk about this. Andy Anako, um, is, is this an important business or isn't it for Apple? And what are they going to do to sort of prevent uh, everybody else from the Googles to the Rokus to the Amazons from uh, stealing this uh, out from under them? I really have to conclude that Apple is planning not an improvement on Apple TV, but a reinvention of it. You know, where we didn't, they didn't just simply, oh, we put it in a better processor and hey, look at the new graphical user interface and hey, look at the new channels we have. There's, I, there, I have to believe that there's going to be a keynote level event in which they talk about the new role that Apple TV is there to, uh, to, to fulfill inside the house. Maybe even going beyond just simply streaming entertainment, but also uh, by being a fixed location, the, the ability to know that, okay, this now the user, the user of this iPhone is now in the living room. And therefore, I'm going to say I'm going to allow this person not to have to even uh, use Touch ID at all to open up and unlock their phone because I'm going to trust the fact that he's he that this person is or this phone is in front of this the, this Apple TV. I'm going to let people uh, send files to each other based on proximity, that sort of stuff. And th that's just one example of stuff and the reason why i have so much faith in that is because apple has let this thing lie fallow for so many quarters and at this point there is no question about it it is the worst major streaming media box you can buy i mean it is barely okay um i have uh, uh, on my uh, on my tv over there in the living room i've got uh, no joke i've got the uh, fire tv i've got a chrome uh, a chromecast and i've got a roku 3 and an apple tv and the times when I switch it over to that HDMI port to use the Apple TV, it is actively painful. The user interface is really so 25-inch Sony Trinitron tube TV grade. Um, after like days and days of getting so much of my entertainment through Roku, I switch over to Apple TV and say, what is that thing? I don't, I don't recognize. Oh, that's a weight cursor. 
I have never in three days of using the Roku, I have never had to say, "Hey, you have to wait because I have to I have to load stuff stuff in." The fact that uh, there's so many uh, open apps for the Roku uh, that. Uh, I've got uh, I've got uh, the the Plex media server that connects to anything inside my house. I've got a media player that if I just simply uh, take like any uh, take any USB stick and just like put it right there into the Roku, it will play any file, any picture, any movie that's on there. There's just no reason for me to recommend that to to the Apple TV to anybody. And because Apple is usually very very smart about once they give up on something, they don't just simply let it sort of peter out they just simply say okay this is this is kind of canceled because we don't have any we don't have any legal reason to do this we don't have any profit reason to do this okay maybe the ipods are kind of a, a contra, contra, contrary to uh, what i'm talking about but there's so much opportunity given how much business they do in streaming media given how much business they want to do in controlling things inside your home such a big opportunity for apple tv i cannot but believe that sometime in 2015, there's going to be a huge event in which everybody is suddenly going to want to have an Apple TV again because God knows no one wants one right now. But, but Andy, it has that amazing game where you, 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 you have to type words by, by, by moving the, the, the cursor <laughs> around. It, it, it's, I love my, a challenge. My favorite, my favorite is the hide-and-seek game where, okay, tiny little remote control that's only this <laughs> thick. Where are you? Three, two, one, I'm coming. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe it works with the Apple Watch. Oh. I noticed I noticed that you're one thousand. You need one thousand more steps to reach ten thousand. So I'm not, I'm going to let you have to not just find the one Apple remote. I'm going to have to find have you find one out of three that's inside. The, oh, anyway, it's part of it's health just, kit. It's just no good. It's yeah. no fun. It's no fun. Sir, Serenity, no, to, uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm saying I have to agree with Andy a hundred percent. Especially you're getting hints. This entire the Apple TV <laughs> has not been refreshed since January of 2013. So that's almost two full years with, um, you know, with nothing going on, um, which says to me, and despite all of that, Tim Cook in, repeatedly goes, we're still interested in this. This is still, this is definitely more than a hobby. We have lots of interest in Apple TV. And you're seeing that despite the fact that it hasn't been up, updated in nearly two years, hardware style, the software improvements has actually been getting it to gain market share. Now, granted, you do have the Chromecast and the Fire TV coming in and impinging upon that because they're better they're better deals at half the price. I mean, that makes sense. If you if you want the only reason to buy an Apple TV right now is if you want iTunes content on your television and the AirPlay, you know, the AirPlay support, which again, Chromecast and 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 being able to to send web pages and stuff like that, that's almost that's almost as good. But the fact that Tim Cook constantly reiterates we are gonna. We are interested in this. We yeah, are gonna do two this. years is nothing, and look at how long we've been expecting the Apple Watch, uh, mm -hmm. the the watch formerly known as the iWatch. I mean, it's just every single announcement. We're like, well, this is gonna be it, and then nothing. Watch. And then when they finally announced it, it was a it was a big initiative that obviously sucked in a lot, tons of resources, and they put a lot of thought and money into it. And so, yeah, it's got to be something like that happening uh, on the Apple TV front. But Allison, I want to ask you about uh, home automation. Do you think that the Apple TV or a TV box is the right place to have a hub for home automation, serving up a home kit type stuff um, uh, through Apple's uh, uh, system? Or is that just uh, not, a, not a good way to do it? Um, I, I don't know that that's really a good way to do it because there's there's a lot of people who don't have televisions these days, right? The, these kids today, you know, with their crazy internet stuff. Um, so I don't know that that's the right place for that. But I, I did want to say, I, I mean, I would think that's a lot more logical to have on your mobile device because if you're upstairs, you don't want to have to go downstairs to the Apple TV to go unlock the door. You know, that kind of thing mm -hmm. doesn't really make much sense to me. Um, but I did want to say, like, like Andy, I've got one of everything. My Fire TV stick comes December 18th. Um, and what I'm finding is that I use the Apple TV a lot but I don't like it. So just like, <laughs> just, just like Andy's saying, so many of those things drive me nuts. My single favorite thing, I mean, I would buy a Roku over an Apple TV for one single thing alone, and that's the 30 second back. And I've noticed that one of the things it does on, I don't know if it's in all applications, but I, I'm pretty sure I saw it in Netflix or it might've been Amazon Prime. When I did 30 second back, it automatically turned on subtitles. Because why do you back up? Because you didn't hear what they said. Yeah. Not because you didn't see usually, it's because of what you heard. And so I use the Roku all the time for Amazon and for Netflix, but I use iTunes uh, to, to rent movies and I use AirPlay all the time. Every time I go to use the Chromecast, I sit there for about a minute and a half going, where's my Chromecast remote? 
Oh, oh, wait, there isn't oh, one. That's, that's right. what it is. It's my and phone. It takes every <laughs> single time. I mean, I've never turned it on and gone, oh, yeah, grab my phone and go do what I got to do. So I, I still think the Apple TV has a place, and it's amazing that it does have a place, considering how awful it is in, in so many ways. <laughs> um, I, I did run into an interesting problem where for about three months straight, Every time I went to play a movie, it would come up and say, okay, you can play it in seven hours or nine hours or six hours. And it would change. It wouldn't be the kind of thing where it said that and then immediately started to play. It would literally take hours. And so I got in the habit of rent the movie, tell Apple to give me my money back. Rent the movie, tell Apple to give me my money back. And I'd flip over to Amazon on the Roku and rent it over there. And finally, I got this crazy idea. I called up Apple. You know, it's weird to think of actually asking for tech support, but I called them up and they told me this double secret remote control thing you can do to reset the Apple TV, which is different than this than the reset that's on screen. And it's different than a full factory reset. And it's different from unplugging it. It's actually, I forget what it is, like hold down the down arrow and the home button at the same time for five seconds. And the woman said, we don't know why this fixes it, but it seems to fix it for almost everybody. And ever since then, it's been perfect. I never get that weird waiting delay anymore. Wow. Yeah, that I, is I've amazing. Had this, I, I've had those same sort of bad experiences. I actually had to. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not averse to giving George Takei more money because I think <laughs> I should give George Takei as much money as I can afford to give him. But I wound up having to rent like his documentary twice because I <laughs> rented it on. I rented it on. Uh, I, I, I made the rental on my on my laptop, figuring that well, I bet that of course as soon as I go into Apple TV, I'll be able to simply play it from there. But no, no dice. But I am able. To, I am able to rent a second copy from the device itself. I'm like. Really, it's like, and, and I, I, yes, I, I did have eight dollars worth of desire to see this movie that very night, so I did rent it again, and I knew I had a blood donation come up, so I could, you know, go see the the the, the other copy. But it's like, it's it, it is such a non-Apple product in that it, it really it, it is a very ordinary product. Again, <laughs> you have the exact same expectations you have with anything you spend a hundred dollars for at Best Buy, which is some parts for it are going to be fine, most of it is going to be okay. And lots of it are going to be, okay, well, they didn't think about that at all. And what an odd thing to think about anything with an Apple logo on it. With a horrible remote. It's yeah. horrible. Oh, God. Well, there is, a, there, is, there is a way that you can actually, there's actually a menu inside the the, the, the settings so that you can actually teach it your uh, whatever remote that you're using like for, with your cable box so that you don't have to. Uh, be, before, before I found out about that, no joke, I actually had the, the little uh, stick of gum remote taped to the back of my usual remote because it was the only way it was, it was like the men's room key at a gas station it was the only way not to lose it so andy my my trick has always just been setting it up on my phone and completely just getting rid of the tiny remote just being like nope sorry it's got yeah. so you, you know i'll put you in a you have to enter your password just, to yeah. get it on the but, network and then you got to go back to the remote and of course it's long and yeah. complex and annoying as all get out but yeah, at that no, point, so, you hide the remote so that you know where it is. You're like, okay, you're going in the top drawer of my media center, buddy, and then I'll find you if I ever need a reset. But otherwise, you don't get lost in the that couch cushions. That might be the last final frontier for certain generations where I know that I, I know I can have a remote app on my phone. I also have the remote app for my cable box, like on all my phones. But there is something about what I, that's one of the things I love about the Roku is that you have this big, thick remote with big, fat buttons because when I'm sitting on the sofa, I'm not. I'm, my mind is not in operating a multi-touch interface application sort of mode. It is, see my see where my thumb is? That is the button that starts the entertainment and pauses the entertainment. And if I it want to, like, if, and, and if I want to, like, stop watching this entertainment and pick out another entertainment, I simply move my thumb up and like this. When I feel a button underneath, I press that. As opposed to, now let's see. Now, okay, so this swipe there we go and now it, i don't i, I want to be able to do things by feel which is which is why another reason why i think that the roku is so well thought out it's a big tv watchers remote as opposed to a we figured a different way of processing aluminum and bonding it to electronics <laughs> to make the lowest profile remote that's ever been made we think it's the greatest <laughs> remote you can buy today can you please yeah, i know where your remote they're, they're is they're not even in my sofa <laughs> I know where your remote is, Andy, because um, my daughter lost her Apple TV remote and we suspected that maybe she got it stuck in her cross-stitch bag and it fell out at my house. So I looked around and I found I had two. So I gave it back to her, but then she found her. So we're up one right now. <laughs> <laughs> They're like socks.
Well, <laughs> I think we can all agree that the Apple TV is the least Apple-esque product that Apple makes. So let's talk about the most Apple-esque product that Apple makes, which is the iPad, which is getting uh, trounced in the education market by the uh, Chromebook, by Google's Chromebook, according to IDC. IDC says that, uh, that for the first time ever, Google has overtaken Apple in American schools. They say that Google shipped 715,000 Chromebooks to schools in the third quarter, while Apple shipped only 702,000 iPads to schools. And Chromebooks now, as a whole, account for a quarter of the educational market overall. This, uh, this sort of uh, is in line with my own thinking about what's best for education. I happen to think that the Chromebook is a fantastic uh, device for the schools and the iPad, not so much, in part because it's so expensive. Uh, what do you think? What do you think about that, uh, Andy? I agree completely. Uh, another because it's it's these things are dead simple. They're dead cheap. I recommend them all the time to lots and lots of people. Just over Thanksgiving, someone was asking me, "Jim, think about buying a notebook for this person." And I've got a budget of X dollars, and they had five hundred dollars to spend. What they thought were what they thought was going to be obviously the best thing is going to be to buy a cheap Windows notebook. And I said, "There." I gave them well here are one or two ideas that are good at that price point, but. Think about $200 for an Acer Chromebook and then give them an iPad as well. They might even like that combination, might get more use out of it. And the, and the other things that we're talking, so yeah, if, you, if you're if you selling something that costs $200 and they're high quality things, they're not junk. The keyboards are as, I will say, I, it, it's going to sound like I'm, I'm trying to be snide here, but I absolutely tell you <laughs> that the keyboard on a $200 Acer Chromebook is as good as the keyboard on my MacBook Pro that I bought just last year because the keyboard on the MacBook Pro is not very good. Uh, they're so much cheaper, but also... They remove the problem since they don't run really anything. They're really easy to administrate. There is, it's hard for someone to get in trouble using one of those. And also they don't have the stealability of an iPad and you don't feel like you're putting kids lives in danger by making, by broadcasting the entire world that there are 300 children that are much smaller and can't run as fast as you uh, that are carrying around a $500 thing in their backpacks. So yeah, I mean, it's, the, the, it's, if Apple made a better statement about how their software is going to be much, much better at what schools need than a Chromebook. Maybe they would be not be doing quite so poorly, but they have not made that case. When's the last time they even talked about iBooks author, about uh, m making even high school textbooks uh, available on iPad? So I don't, I think that maybe this is another thing where Apple is interested, but maybe they're not they didn't. They didn't see that quick vein of gold, and they don't like the numbers that are coming in, and they're just going to wait and see how well this can do in the future. I don't know. Absolutely. They're just juggling too much. Yeah. You know, they're just they're just trying to juggle too much. Uh, iBooks Author is a great piece of software that's now a year out of date. And granted, they they made some really really wonderful under the hood improvements when Yosemite came out. But overall, like Apple basically said, hey. We're really interested in education. We've always been really interested in education. Now put that on pause while we work on the Apple Watch and the Apple TV and the new iPhone <laughs> and the new, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get back to you eventually, right? Yeah. yeah. And no, think, it's, um, think, go ahead. I was going to say, I think the administrative costs just by itself is what this really should be. If if I were in, in administering a, a group of uh, machines for a school, I'd be hard pressed to not go with Chromebooks. Um, we've talked before about how uh, Apple had the great deal with the LA school district on on the iPads, and it, and it fell through because the minute the minute the uh, the students got them, they just figured out how to get around all the restrictions. And <laughs> it, personally, I would have taken that group of students and said, "Okay, we're going to put you in computer science class right <laughs> now and encourage that behavior instead of punishing them." But when you think about dealing with administrative costs, in fact, that's one of the reasons we've always pushed Macs over over PCs, even when PCs were cheaper, you just spent so much less time screwing around with the, you know, the updates and all that kind of stuff on the Mac side and viruses and all that nonsense. Now you've got the Chromebook where it, that's a really tough sell because you don't have to hardly administer those at all. And so if you've got reasonably good hardware, um, I think that's a that's a great point. Another person, I, shoot, I wish I'd, I lost it here in the, in the uh, live chat room. Somebody pointed out, does anybody steal Chromebooks? It's never happened. Ever in so, the history of mankind, <laughs> except except a, 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 a Chromebook Pixel. I might even steal a Chromebook Pixel, but the regular ones, no. 
Sure. Never happened. So that might they're like, be they're a like consideration. They're like stealing too. paper napkins at McDonald's. Yeah. Like, okay, maybe you can, but why would you? And why would you admit it? <laughs> and who would, who would well, report it? the resale it? value, right? The resale value is not great. Yeah, right. exactly. Well, uh, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to have picks galore. We're all going to have picks. Uh, Allison, you can have a pick of the week for us as uh, well? I will pull something out. Okay, great. See what you, I can do. You work on that. I will work on the break. Uh, I want to tell you about personal capital. You know, um, Andy was... Um, showing off and waving around his fancy Moto 360 watch. Personal Capital is a is a, uh, a service that will help you get your financial life in order. They were one of the very first apps on Android Wear. That's right. I think I, it was a week into Android Wear, and I was getting a, a buzzing feeling on my wrist wearing my, I think it was an LG G watch at the time, and it was telling me that I had, uh, that I was about to incur a $35 fee uh, from my bank uh, and this is an alert that I didn't see on my phone. I didn't see it on my desktop. I didn't go to the website. I felt it on my wrist. I looked down. I took action, and I saved myself 35 bucks. Wham! Personal capital is free, and I already saved $35. This is what a fantastic service this is. The basic way that you use personal capital, usually you're not going to use it mainly through the watch. You're mostly going to use it online. What they do is you plug in all your different financial accounts, your bank accounts, your your investments, your 401k, all that kind of stuff. And then it brings all that information and shows you in charts and graphs in an intuitive, easy to understand way, what the heck is happening with your money. And when you can see that sort of 10,000 foot view of what's happening with your money, you can make better decisions. It'll alert you and prevent you from wasting money on unnecessary fees and fines. It's just a fantastic way to get your financial life in order. And I think most of us just have vague ideas about what's happening with our money, and it's not good enough. You have to have specific, clear understanding of where it's going, what's happening, where the danger spots, how you can make changes and adjustments so that you lose less money and make more money, save more money, and basically get control of your money because eventually you're going to want to have as much money as you possibly can. You don't want to waste it on uh, unnecessary stuff that goes on with in the financial uh, services uh, world. So just... Take a minute. It pays big dividends. Uh, personal capital gives you total clarity and transparency. And again, the, the, the thing is that you can make better decisions, better investment decisions, better decisions about the fees you're paying, better decisions about how much to spend, just all across the board, better decisions. And that's the right way to get your financial house in order. To set up your free account, go to personalcapital.com slash MacBreak. Personal capital is free, and it's a smart way to grow your money. And we thank Personal Capital for their support of Mac break weekly andy and Otko, do you have a pick of the week uh yes i do let's see if i can get crane cam 3000 the future video podcasting set up for you uh i've been talking <laughs> a lot about like really good like folding pocket keyboards because ever since the uh uh, ever since the iPhone 6 Plus came out, that's really nice big screen. You kind of want to be able to blast through emails or even just like actual write full things with it. Um, and one of my picks a few weeks ago was one of my first nice discoveries, which was the uh, iWorks keyboard, uh, W-E-R-K-Z, uh, which folds out nicely. It has this big, big kind of ugly gap, but I found that you can actually sort of make your way, uh, it, it, you, you get used to it after your first like hundred words or whatever with it. And it has this nice little uh, actual uh, case that doubles as a phone stand. Uh, but I since then have found something that's even better, even though it's about twice as much. Uh, this is the uh, Fly Shark folding keyboard. Uh, it is T almost twice as much, which is sounds okay. It sounds bad until you realize that this costs thirty dollars. This is also a folding Bluetooth keyboard, and it sells on Amazon for fifty. Uh, and what the reason why I like it so much? Already too much clutter on this desk. Sorry about this. Is that you flip it open, and here's what you get. And what I'm calling your attention to is that what you don't get is that really big gap between uh, these two halves of the folding keyboard. You also get a space bar that is, you can basically put your thumbs wherever you want. Uh, I also like the fact that, uh, like the, uh, like the uh, iWorks, it also has mechanical switches on the side so that the battery will not run down until you actually tell it, uh, until you actually turn it on, turn it off, the battery won't run down inside your bag. Uh, and it's very, very comfortable to type with. The only disadvantage of it is that the numbers, as you can see, are accessible by a function key. So whereas the $30 one actually has its own little row of, uh, of, of numbers here, uh, this one, you actually, to get numbers, you have to hold on a function key in order to get that working. But 
all in all, I actually find it fast, a lot faster to type on this than on this because uh, I don't know if you can actually see this, but the, there is actually an over, some of these keys actually overlap over the hinge. Like look at the, the H key right there. So as a result, when it's lying flat like that, you get something that's almost identical to the feel of a real keyboard. And it is almost the same size uh, and layout if I can do this without spilling all over the place, uh, almost the exact same size as uh, the my MacBook Pro keyboard here. Pardon the crumbs and the mess. It's been a long, long holiday. Uh, and so uh, I think that this is the one that I'm going to wind up with as my, as my final recommendation. It's not perfect, but no uh, pocketable, foldable keyboard is going to be as good as like an Apple wireless keyboard. Uh, and it does get me right to the solution that I want to get to, which is the ability to simply travel for the day with just this inside my pocket and realize this is the iPhone 6 Plus. You put the, even an iPhone 6, it really takes up no extra space in your pocket. And I feel as though if I have that extra unexpected hour and a half, two hours, uh, if I miss my train, I can actually set up on a table and I feel as though I can get an hour's worth of actual typing and actual work done with it. So it's $50. The only, uh, uh, I, you, a lot of people might require a recommendation from somebody <laughs> on uh, to uh, before they will, they would trust this. Come on, Crane Cam 3000. Um, because the only place I can find to buy it is Amazon and it has that sort of imported from China and it might or might not work marketing lingo where it is best freshest blue tooth key type for great with iPhone, iPad, uh, <laughs> Nexus uh, phone. Uh, but uh, trust me, it, it really is the works. Uh, it uh, started off as a Kickstarter, as a matter of fact, which is how my attention got called to it. But now it's an actual uh, shipping product. And for 50 bucks, I mean, there's a, the only keyboard I've found that's better is this one from Lapworks, which folds out uh, twice. It's based on the old uh, uh, handspring uh, keyboard that folds in and folds in like that. It's very, very good. But the problem is that the only really trustworthy place to get it, I mean, it's good enough that I would actually recommend it, is Lapworks, and they charge 140 bucks for it. So for $140, you really have to be certain that you're going to get a lot of use out of this. For 50 bucks, it makes a good present. It makes a good, oh, I may as well just buy this just in case and put it inside your, your handbag and just keep it in there. Uh, what's, really, what's really a nice recommendation. What's the name of the new one, Andy? Andy, Excuse the me? one that you are recommending, what is the name of it one more it's time? Called the Fly, it's called the Fly Shark. The the name, they the, the, uh, the company is Fly Shark. They call it the iLepo. I don't know why they call it iLepo. <laughs> it's the seventh Marx Brothers, I know. Uh, and as, as if and if you look for either of those two names, you will only find references to the Kickstarter. You will not find a store page or a, or a product page. The only place I can find that actually has it is Amazon. Um, the, oh, the, the only other thing that I could say that be prepared about it is that, like a lot of these other folding keyboards, it really work. It's a lot more stable if you have like if you have your your screen cleaning cloth or a handkerchief and you put that underneath it because otherwise the bottom these are supposed to be like rubberized like anti skid things but they're not quite grabby enough so it's possible when you're typing for it to sort of slide around a little bit but if you put like any lap? sort of a, oh no, it doesn't work on okay. I, I, your, your your lap is is daintier than I. Than mine, uh, it's 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 not it's not lappable by any by any means. Uh, you do need to have like on top of a, a hard, stable surface in order to make it work. But if you put it on top of any sort of cloth, that finds I find that that stops it from skidding around. Uh, that's the only hassle. And you know, it's winter time. You should have a handkerchief with you anyway, so that's not uh, not a bad thing. Wonderful, the Fly Shark I Lepo. I guess the brand name I Leper was taken, so they went with I Lepo. Uh, what are you going to do, Serenity Caldwell? What do you have for us? All right, my pick of the week is an app, um, and I blame Jason Snell entirely for this. Uh, <laughs> over Thanksgiving, he was it's talking usually safe about. To do so. It's true. It's true. <laughs> I blame him for a lot of things in my life. Um, he was talking about, you know, uh, an app that had captivating captivated him during the Thanksgiving weekend called Crossy Road, uh, which is <laughs> very similar I know to this it's, game. it's yeah, Sorry. it's like flap, Flappy Bird meets Frogger is how I've heard it described. It's it's very well designed. Um, the sort of 3D blocky graphics are are really delightful. It is an infuriating game, an absolutely infuriatingly delightful game um, that I played way too much of this Thanksgiving when I had Floridian Sun to sit out. Instead, I was like inside trying to beat this silly, silly game. 
um, which you can't beat it because, of course, it's a never-ending uh, series of cars and and trains and leapfrogs that you have to dance around. And although it does have some some little in-app purchase gimmicks that are kind of silly, um, I, I just really enjoyed playing this. I had a, a seven-year-old hanging out who saw me playing it. It was like, ooh, it's the chicken game. Can I play the chicken game? Oh, you shouldn't press on that. That's bad. Oh, if you do, like, he, he got so into it with me. So it was a really good way to uh, to bond over vacation um, with, a, with a seven-year-old and a way to, to escape actually going outdoors. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, I definitely recommend everybody play it. It's It's just... It's just silly. It's silly. It's a good time. And it's really like it's it's more addicting than you think about, you know, hanging out and, and just who who's playing that right now? Or is it just a video? Because it's I'm I'm now slightly captivated <laughs> watching this. <laughs> just a video. <laughs> just just oh, as yeah, a, I love these games. Were, uh, even as a, even if they were just a screensaver, I would spend five dollars just to have that as a screensaver. It's a really beautiful piece of art. It really is. Yeah. Very, very cool. All right. Well, that looks fun. That looks really fun. I want to try that. Uh, Allison, what do you have for us? Well, unfortunately, I don't have a Chromecast 3000, uh, the future of video podcasting, uh, but I, I will try to show off. I'm going to go very old school here. I'm going to show off a book. George from Tulsa, one of the listeners of my show, sent me this for uh, my 500th, 500th episode. It's called Iconic. It's a photographic tribute to Apple innovation. It's a giant hardcover coffee table book, and it is just beautiful. It's got an introduction by uh, Jim Dowerrumpel and one by uh, Steve Wozniak. And it doesn't do what you would think it would do. It, it doesn't go chronologically through everything Apple ever did. Instead, it's got sections uh, for things like peripherals. And um, so it's got a lot of the cool old school stuff. Uh, let's see, I, I bookmarked a couple of pages that look kind of cool in here. And they're, they're just just beautiful photographs and, and little tiny short explanations of, uh, of what they're showing you and when things were introduced. The very last page of it has a picture. Let's see, I got to bring this up here. Is is kind of poignant. It's got a picture of of Steve Jobs' glasses at the. Oh, that's bright on that camera. But anyway, you can believe me. It's his glasses. It is beautiful. It's thick. It's heavy. It's just it's just yummy coffee table ness for that sort of thing. It uh, runs sixty two dollars on uh, Amazon right now. And again, it's called Iconic. And I probably should have remembered who did it. But it's just beautiful. I, I'm I'm really really digging this. I just got it a couple hours. Jonathan Zufi is the guy's name. Cool. Just wonderful. Yeah. That looks very very cool. Can't wait to see that. Well, my pick of the week is an application called Typed. Hope you guys didn't cover this on a previous show. Uh, uh, it's called Typed, and basically it's a it's a word processor. It's a minimalist word processor. We've all seen them. The kind of thing where you want to type, you just want to write, and it takes over the screen and blocks out all the sort of clutter and and that sort of thing. The problem with most of the of those uh, types of word processors is that they're too minimalist. They they yeah they clear out the distractions, but they also clear out the tools that you need, and they also don't produce the kinds of documents you want. One of the great things about Typed is that it'll it's a it's a markdown editor so you can it'll it'll generate web friendly html versions of your documents if you want to if you want them uh, which is really useful i think most of us uh, write for the web uh, i certainly do and uh, if you're going to do anything that's going to have any markup in it it's nice if that is automated you don't have to sit there and type uh, type that out uh, it also has a, a zen mode which uh, will basically get rid of all the controls and play like uh, new agey kind of music in the background, sort of ambient music. That's a little uh, a little cheesy. They have a another thing called responsive layout, which basically it'll resize itself automatically to whatever size you want to uh, use it in. Uh, now, the, the the good news is that it's a really great functional uh, word processing document that helps you write because it clears your mind and, and helps you focus on uh, on your words instead of the tools, instead of the environment. Uh, and that's, you know, again, the good news. The bad news is available only for the Mac and it costs $19.99. They don't have a freemium model. They don't have a free version, which I think is a mistake. They should have one so you can try it out. People are very particular about their writing tools and 20 bucks isn't uh, you know that, that's that's a, that's real money, uh, and so it'd be nice to have a free version you could try for a trial period or upgrade for more features or whatever. But no, you have to pay the money in order to try it. But having said that, it's a very very nice um, uh, editor, and it's just a fantastic uh, way to write. And and I know that uh, uh, those of you who write, you know that the biggest 
barrier, I think, for most of us in writing is the fact that there are distractions everywhere. <laughs> and so, have you, you seen Focus Writer, Mike? It's, I have. Um, I think it's open source, but it, it's uh, Windows and Mac and Linux. I think on all. I think it's on all three. It's at least on two of the three of those, and uh, it has sort of the same kind of thing with the themes, and and really definitely does help you focus. But I'm always just flipping away from it anyway because I want to go do <laughs> something else. Yeah, well, it's uh, I, I'm a big fan of that genre. Sometimes I just want to, and that's one of the reasons why I often use my iPad for writing uh, because it's uh, it's more clutter free. Uh, but if you uh, if if you got to use a MacBook Pro with Retina. This is the way to get that iPad experience of minimalism and, you know, nothing else going on so you can fo uh, you can focus and concentrate. Well, that is, ladies and gentlemen, Mac Break Weekly. I want to thank you, Andy Anatko, Serenity Caldwell, Allison Sheridan, and thank you, Jason Howell. Uh, thanks to all of you, uh, viewers and listeners, the Mac Break Weekly audience, the hordes of ravenous uh, Apple fans out there who watch this show every single week, and I, I, I'm i one of you. Uh, <laughs> I enjoy the show, and it's nice to be able to talk back to these people for a change uh, rather than just listening. Uh, so this has been a thrill for me, and and I appreciate uh, Leo. Leo's uh, kite surfing or something today. Uh, and uh, so it was great to be able to step in, in uh, and uh, take his place for one day at least. Uh, Andy Anako, Chicago Sun-Times technology columnist, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. And uh, what, what's what's been going on? What are you looking forward to this uh, uh, this month and uh, over the holidays? Uh, basically, a lot of uh, deep soak reviews are coming out in the next uh, few weeks, starting with my, finally my iPad Air 2 review. As usual, it's uh, the Ken Burns effect uh, applied to a review, which is let's have the slow pull in. Let's talk. Let's read letters from from colonists before we talk about what the <laughs> CPU clock speed is. So uh, and also, of course, the obligatory uh, holiday gift guys are coming out this week. Wonderful. And Serenity Caldwell, thank you so much for joining us as well. You're a panelist on the Incomparable podcast, and you are the you're, you're the manager of editors uh, over one, at iMore. One manager of editors. I'm, I'm joined by Peter Cohen, who is the manager of Mac editors. Ah, I see. I see. And what are you guys working on this month? Oh, we're working on tons of really exciting stuff. Um, we're revamping a, a little bit about how we do content. So look for a lot more uh, stuff on apps, uh, including stuff by yours truly to come out soon. We've got a ton of gift guide stuff that's already up that we launched over Black Friday. And I hear rumors that we might be doing eBooks. Hmm, that's an so. interesting rumor. You heard it but here they, but first. You, you need to have some sort of an expert on staff who knows eBooks. You're, it's, it's a fool's game you're oh, getting into, Serenity. Oh, oh no, wait, I, wait a minute. <laughs> It's one of the greatest experts in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give away my secret identity, Andy. Does, it, does that mean that now I can't hit you up for a free advice on putting together my own ebooks? That's fine. I should have been paying you anyway. That's all right. <laughs> and I will still give you the giant Toblerone on box that I was going to give you for Christmas. <laughs> oh, Merry Christmas to you. It's only December 2nd. Come on. Merry Christmas. Uh, Allison Sheridan <laughs> is at the Nozilla Mac podcast. Thank you so much for jumping in. We, uh, we, Pulled you in at the last second. I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing with us. Uh, what else is going on with you besides the Nocilla Mac podcast? It's actually No Silicast Mac podcast. Um, I've managed to work it in twice, but I'm going to do it a third time. This week will be gratuitous excitement about having done 500 shows. I, I, my one strength is that I come out with the show absolutely every Sunday night. Um, if I'm ever going to be late, I'll make sure the next, the previous one's early, that kind of thing to make it all wash out. Um, been going nine and a half years, and it's kind of just going to be a big old gratuitous yay party this uh, this coming Sunday. Um, but in general, the show is, like I said, a Mac buy us, but we do stuff on accessibility. I'm really interested in tools for the blind. Um, we do, um, I've done reviews of things like the Nokia 635 Windows phone that I actually really kind of liked. I don't know if I'm yeah. allowed to say it on the show, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot of fun and it's a, it is a tech show, but it is very, very Mac biased for sure. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for coming in uh, and on short notice. I really appreciate it. Uh, great to see your, you know, the chat room loves you. And fun, uh, fun to finally get to talk to you directly and to Serenity. I'd never met Serenity before. So yeah. hi, Serenity. Yes. <laughs> hi, Allison. <laughs> and of course, everybody's met Andy. All right. Well, we do Mac Break weekly at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC, every single Tuesday, right here on the Twit Network. Uh, you can watch live at live.twit.tv or subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Feedly, Yahoo, RSS, and many other options. You can choose your favorite at twit.tv. So get to work. Break time is over.